Hi there, and welcome to The Artist's Craft. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we have an outstanding guest with us in studio today. Frank Stacio is the host of the State of Things on North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. A native of Buffalo, Frank has been in radio since the age of 19. He began his public radio career at WOI in Ames, Iowa, where he was a magazine show anchor and the station's news director. From there, he went to National Public Radio, where he rose from associate producer to newscaster on All Things Considered. He left that job in 1990 to help start an alternative school in Washington, D.C. Frank returned to NPR as a freelance news anchor, guest host of Talk of the Nation, and other national programs, and host of special news coverage. Thank you very much for being on the show today, Frank. Great to be here. So for the one or two folks in our television <laughs> audience who aren't familiar with the state of things, what is the show about? We like to consider ourselves a, a kind of an ideas show. It's about North Carolina, but there's nothing that happens in North Carolina that doesn't happen everywhere else. So we can do, uh, we can talk about law and order. We can talk about uh, ideas in race relations, religion, culture, art, literature. All of those things become part of the show. North Carolina has, you know, examples of sort of all those things and ways to talk about national issues um, that are rooted right here in North Carolina. Do you lean towards uh, one area or the other? Do you have a specialty that you feel most uh, akin to? Yeah, it's hard to say. I'll bet if you listen to the show enough, and, and you'd have to do this, I would have to go back. I'm guessing we emphasize a lot of history and literature. If, if you took, you know, if this was a Trivial Pursuit, mm -hmm. those would be our two categories <laughs> that we would always pick if we had the choice. Um, history because it always tells us about where we are, sure. and we have such great historians who can take a look at the political and cultural history of you know, any of the issues that we're dealing with today. Um, and literature. We have so many great writers in this state, well, and musicians too, so we do a lot of music. How many folks work on the show? We have four producers uh, and an engineer, so it's, a, it's actually, that may sound like a lot, it's like the man talks for an hour a day, why does he need all those people? Uh, but honestly, in the grand scheme of things, uh, if you look at what goes on in radio, that's a very, very small staff. How important is the chemistry that you mm -hmm. have with the producers and everybody else on the show? It's crucial. It's crucial. I mean, the, the show comes together as the result of a conversation that is ongoing. So we're screaming over the cubicles and this guest dropped out, so that means the show has to go in another direction. Our conversation about the topic, it becomes the structure of the conversation you hear on the air. Now take us through an episode of, of the State of Things, sort of from behind the scenes. Where does an episode begin? Are there meetings? Mm. Uh, take us through that. Well, we have a morning meeting, so every day we show up at uh, 8.30 or so, gather and talk about that day's show. And, and it's mostly focused on what's going to happen at noon that day. We run through it. Our A guest is going to be, you know, if you take today's show, taking a look at the viral grassroots nature of the uh, gay rights protests that have emerged since Prop 8. We found uh, one of the guys here in Raleigh who was waiting for the leadership to do something, and they didn't. So he put a posting on Facebook, and a week later he's got 600 people showing up. So um, who is he? Where did, how, how did we find him? And oh, don't we know a blogger who we've had on the show? Mm -hmm. And let's put them together and talk about that. That's our A, and then we go through the B and the C, music guests. Hey, they've got a really interesting story about how they came together. Make sure we get to that. That's our morning meeting. Well, if you're just tuning in, the guest is Frank Stacio. He is the host of the State of Things on WUNC, uh, National Public Radio here in, in North Carolina, which broadcasts, tell us again, uh, uh, or it, it broadcasts in Manio, Rocky Mount, yeah, and, and in the Triangle area, and, right? And in the Triangle, yeah. So yeah. a big part of North Carolina and Eastern North Carolina, really. Little, yeah, we'd love to get out west and kind of branch out a little bit, but yes, so what far. What do we have to do to, to make that happen? Uh, <laughs> Call today. The number is 800. <laughs> Pledge now, and I'll give you a toaster and a book bag. Very cool. How do you, I'm sure one of the things that, that uh, the questions that you get all the time, um, how do you select your guests? Again, that's that ongoing conversation. The, the producers on the State of Things are really bright. They're, re they're ingenious and uh, younger than me. 
So, so the, everybody's coming to, to the table with ideas. Sometimes it's a news uh, hook, but sometimes it's this, it's this sort of vague idea, you know? It comes around tax time and we think, well, well where, do our, where does the tax money go? And how can we create a program that talks about, you know, the, the, the underlying, um, the foundations of a tax policy or the history of a tax policy? What is marriage? Where did it come from? And, and can we talk about the history of marriage and how it came to be a religious, you know, civil uh, idea in, mm -hmm. in uh, our culture? And then when did it get bound up in these culture wars over gay rights, for instance? So that's what will happen. And that idea then takes shape over a course of days and maybe weeks as we massage it and think, well, is it academic? Is it, is it activists? Who's mm -hmm. going to talk about this? How many? How many people who've had an experience mm -hmm. need to be on this show, and how many? Uh, how far back can we go in terms of academic does research? It tend, does it tend to the um, sort of this conceptual approach to, to lining up guests and show ideas? Does that tend to be the the A guest, and then some of these other guests are developed? And what, how does that theme work? Well, in an the, show? so so we can see the show in three parts that we can marry any way we want. So we can have a full hour on a single topic, but mm -hmm. we still have a twelve minute original segment or A segment, 20 minutes in the B and then, and then 17 in the C. And we follow this newspaper format that we sort of, sort of don't know why because people don't listen this way, but we put the news in the top. So if it's about an event that day mm. and it has to do with news, then it's going to be in the A. But if it's a concept show, you know, what is marriage? Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? Then, then, the whole, then we're not going to look at it that way. We're going to conceive the show entirely differently. And though there will be a narrative arc, we know that people are actually tuning in and out. But we want, we want to know that if you tuned in at 20 minutes after, mm -hmm. the way we're talking you know, makes it sound like we're part of some continuous conversation. How did you first come to the state of things? Just looking at that one show, how did, how did, how did you first get involved with the state of things? Well, I was a freelancer for a long time after I left NPR. You said we started a school for a while up in Washington, D.C., and that school lost its funding. We had to move on, and so I decided to freelance and uh, would come to places like North Carolina to fill in for hosts, uh, particularly nationally syndicated programs. Um, in the case of the state of things, the station manager wanted to kind of upgrade the program. So uh, I came down here swearing never to take another job. So <laughs> every place I'd go, to, to be honest, a station manager might ask, well, would you you know, would you like to work here? And I'd say, well, I'd love to work here, but that would mean I'd, I'd need to take a job, and I don't want a job, so, so thanks. Until I got here, and the, and the stories that we were covering and the, and the rich intellectual and literary, and as well as musical. It just felt right. It was amazing, you know, so I, I, I just couldn't get over it. And I said, wow, if the opportunity ever arises, I'll take it. And then it arose. It did, so. Awesome. Well, I want to ask a little bit about uh, I'm, I'm learning here. This is, I'm taking notes as we're doing this, folks. <laughs> uh, what major changes have you seen in terms of the audience for radio since you first got involved in radio to today? How's the audience for radio changed? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to look at the demographics of the public radio audience. They mm -hmm. have pretty much aged with me. So there's a way of answering that question that, by way of saying not at all. But we, we're, we've got this younger audience. I mm -hmm. run into kids all the time, people in their 20s and 30s and, and even uh, late teens. They listen all the time and they love some segment or other. I don't know why they're listening, to be honest. Uh, I, we know that we talk about ideas and we hope we talk about them in an interesting way. But we're told that younger folk aren't listening to public or to radio as much anymore. Do you believe that? Well, again, it's hard to measure. On the one hand, we know that the audience for any broadcast is, is declining. Radio, TV, public, commercial. It's, we're losing listeners and viewers mm -hmm. by the day. They're going on to, for on-demand listening and viewing. That's where they're going. Um, WNC is an example of that. Overall, we're losing a few listeners every year. Our show it happens to be building audience, so we're going mm -hmm. in the opposite direction. I don't know how long that's going to go on. It's an island in the storm. It is. It is indeed. We're bucking the trend. Well, so what do you, what do you see as, as the future in the next 10 years for radio? Is it going to be wed closer to the Internet? Is that one direction that it will go? What do you see as the future in the next 10 years? It's demand listening without a doubt. So what we've shown, I think, from our latest research and the fact that people are 
are listening in greater numbers and younger listeners is that there's an appetite for what we do. People want to hear about ideas. They want to hear them discussed in an intelligent way, if I can talk about our staff and how we fashion the show. What they don't want to do so much is tune in at noon every day to WUNC 91.5. Mm -hmm. That's what they're not doing. So we have to find a delivery model mm -hmm. and a way for us to get paid to deliver what we know to be a product people want in the way that they want it, which is on demand when they listen to it when they want. So how do you do it? Well, if I knew that, as, the, as my well, guest always does. Well, we do podcasts, but we don't you charge for it. So, so, so it's up there, and we know we get a lot of, a lot of hits. Mm -hmm. But what most people have found, whether they're newspapers or you know, uh, the music industry as well, is it's hard to get people to pay for something that has been traditionally, and to refer to the mm -hmm. internet as a tradition, seems crazy, but it's been free. So, so how do we create a radio show that you can get any time, but have to pay for? Is there, do we go up on iTunes? Is it 99 cents an episode? Would, I, so I don't know. It seems like, uh, well, your show, you know, it's not really a celebrity-driven show. It's more of a story-driven show. Mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the online model as it is right now, if somebody's looking for information on you know, John Grisham or, or, right. or whoever, uh, I know I've done this. And, and then found shows like Terry Gross's show and then right. said, okay, this is somebody I was looking for info on. And it's, you know, available through looking, you know, doing a Google search or whatever. Right. I wonder if there's a way to, to sort of wed that sort of search engine looking that people, like you say, are, are doing uh, with, with the idea for this show. Well, I think there is. But again, the question is, once they find us, how do they get us? Right now we're free. Mm -hmm. online or we're free to listen to uh, but we we don't know how to send, then send you that mm -hmm. that fundraising letter that we bother you with for a week at a time three three times a year um, to, so that we can get paid and it's viral I mean what we're finding is we get a band on the show and they've told all their friends and we're on Facebook and before you know it there are 2,000 people who know about today's show sure. within 12 seconds that's great. So, so all of that, and I think that's responsible for building the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a question of, of sort of building fundraising. And you talk to the folks at the NNO, they're having the same problem. It's a good newspaper. They're, they're, we had uh, to a writer and a producer on from The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. And they were telling us how much they have to read. And the producer went to Duke and says, yeah, I read uh, four, five, six transcripts a day. I go through the transcripts and then seven newspapers a day. So he, so we're, lamenting the fact that everybody's getting their news from The Daily Show, and The Daily Show is getting their show from the newspapers. And that's what's going on. So there's, we can't do without it. There's a secret. Yeah. There's a secret, folks. Well, the guest is Frank Stacio. He is the host of The State of Things on WUNC, which airs at what time? 12 noon, and then again at 9 o'clock. 12 noon and, and 9 o'clock. Uh, what first attracted you to the profession of radio? Oh, man. I, I was uh, doing nothing, and a good friend at a, in, in college, as most of us were at the time, and uh, a good friend was at the college radio station. He said, oh, you got to come down. We're having a blast. You know, we, we spin records, and we're doing these comedy things, and come on down. That was it. So that was the first getting your feet wet in radio. Yeah. And what was your first professional job in radio? Uh, I worked in Buffalo, New York, as a newscaster uh, at WYSL. What kind of? Uh, it's a, it was a top 40, top 40 AM station when AM stations were really big and, uh, you know, people had big voices and yelled a lot. What kind of news stories were you, were you covering there? In short. Buffalo? There were short news stories. <laughs> We'd have a, a five-minute newscast. They'd be 20 seconds each with a, you know, 12-second sound bite. And, and, they would, and they would include copy, you know, like uh, there was a seven-year-old East Side girl was strained through the grill of a 1966 Chevrolet today. Because that kind of writing is good. What is your most vivid memory of, of that first job? Fear. Just abject fear. That, that mic went on. And the guy, I had to go on the air uh, my first time in the middle of the week with a, with a DJ who was iconic in Buffalo. The guy's name was Kevin O'Connell. And he was an icon. And uh, I, li I grew up listening to the guy. He's across the glass and he, and he points. And I'm going to talk on his radio station and I'm going to be that guy. I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I really, I have no memory of it except just this, this, this knot terror. of fear. There was this color. It's kind of a purple-blue <laughs> and it was in the middle of me. 
fear. I can't relate to that at all. No, I've never <laughs> been terrified on this show. I think people have watched me kind of get stuck in the middle of uh, the headlights, like a deer in the headlights <laughs> a few times on this show. Do you consider yourself a reporter, mm -hmm. an entertainer, or something else entirely, an astronaut, for example? I'm, I am an astronaut. Um, I'm an information performance artist. I'd say I'm an information performance artist. Uh, and then you can make of that what you will. It, it's, a, it's all of that. It is a show. It needs to, it's a, and it's a drama. And I need to have a theatrical sense about me, which is not to say, you know, buffoonery, but it is, it is the arc of the story, the rising tension, you know, the, the, the story has to come to a climax, we have to get us there, and then we have to, to move into some kind of, uh, some kind of point. Hmm. So I'm aware of that and, and guiding the story as a kind of director, as a kind of theatrical director in some ways. That's the theater. Uh, journalist, yeah, it should be about something. It should matter. It should be a, be a matter of public policy and somehow inform that either in the, in the most superficial detail of the day's events, but hopefully with a, with a deeper underlying uh, understanding of where these notions of ours come from. How important is preparation? Mm. Or are you good enough now that you know you, you come in at eight and you're like, okay, who are we interviewing at noon? And no. then you're ready to go at noon. I'm good enough to know that if I don't get prepared, it's gonna be a really bad uh, day. And that's where the staff comes in. I mean, they just generate a lot of material that I then have to work on while I'm there and take home and synthesize. Mm -hmm. what, what gets better over time and faster and easier is that process. Hmm. But you have to do it every day. You have mm -hmm. to study, you have to read. It, it just happens a little faster, I, and I don't worry so much anymore because I know if I read it and think about it, I'll be able to talk about it tomorrow. What interviewers inspired you early in your career? All of them, and it's funny, I, you know, I mean, people like, uh, certainly Ted Koppel is a guy who I admire mm -hmm. and will forever for his, his kind of steady, you know, perseverance and intelligence. But Merv Griffin, because he had that wonderful theatrical sense. You know, Merv was just so, and he'd say, no, but didn't you once? And I found myself doing that, and I, and I said, I'm imitating Merv Griffin. Uh, and, and Johnny Carson. I mean, they all had, uh, in one way or another, brought some, some aspect of what's required to make a show work. If you're just tuning in, the guest is Frank Stacio. He is the host of State of Things on WUNC. Uh, what are, let's, let's dig into a little bit more of the process. Uh, this is fascinating to me, the process of producing a show and the, the way that radio works, just because it's something I don't know much about at all. Uh, what are the similarities or differences between a newscaster mm -hmm. and a news director? What job differences do those two uh, people have? Well, the newscaster is responsible for a day-to-day -day, you know, product. They have to put out a five-minute newscast or seven of them a day. They ch tend to write the material, choose the whatever tape inserts are going to be part of that cast, and kind of design it. And then they go home. The news director has a bigger vision. What kinds of things do we cover? How do we deploy staff? You know, how do I manage these folks? So it's a management position. Which do you think you're more suited to, to do? Which one is more enjoyable and rewarding? Well, I, neither of those for me mm -hmm. these days. I mean, I don't think I could go back to doing either one. Um, I enjoyed both of them, but now this, this business of creating a narrative and, and um, managing a conversation mm -hmm. is to me the only thing I can imagine doing in broadcasting. Now, I found this uh, kernel of, of uh -oh. trivia here uh, online. One of your favorite shows of the past year was Remembering Blind Boy Fuller. Oh, yeah. uh, for our audience, who was Blind Boy Fuller and what did you learn about him in doing this show. Blind Boy Fuller is a blues musician. He's a, is a Piedmont blues guitarist. And so I'm a blues fan and have known about Blind Boy for a long time. What I didn't realize was that he was born here. Actually, I think he was born in maybe Wilson. Hmm. Anyway, he lived most of his life in Durham. Prowled the streets of the, of the American tobacco complex, played for tips, had a recording contract. And I was running one day along the tobacco trail and there's a plaque honoring blind boy if I said he's from here we've got to hmm. we've got to talk about this guy I didn't know uh, he, and he's an amazing story because the Piedmont style was a very particular kind of mm -hmm. guitar playing and he was one of the most well-known practitioners so to tell his story is to tell the story of, of Durham in the 30s it's the story of, of African-American life uh, in the 30s um, and the development of, of a particular music and so yeah I enjoyed that 
Now tell us a little bit about interviewing uh, Arrested Development. What surprised you the most in that interview? They were great. First of all, they're charming, they're charismatic, they're extremely talented group of people. And they were deeply thoughtful about their music, about the importance of it. They've been around since the, since the early 90s, so they've seen a lot of things change. And uh, they had some real insights into not only the music business, but again, the culture of music. Hmm, fascinating. Now, you started your career in public radio at WOI, Ames, Iowa. Mm. What do you remember most vividly about WOI? Well, we were in the middle of a cornfield, uh, pretty much literally. And, uh, but I did a show there called, uh, called um, I don't remember the name of the show. But it was based on As It Happens. It was which like a magazine a show. Well, right? and it was CBC. It was based on a CBC show, Call Out. So you would call out to newsmakers and you would sort of get interviews that way. Uh, and the station manager there thought it was a great idea. I grew up listening to As It Happens in Buffalo and had always wanted to be part of that show. Um, so there I ended up in Iowa. They were doing it and I became the host and, and news director. There. I, was a lot of I fun. don't know As It Happens. What was as it it's a call out show. So what you'll do is you'll have a host who will, uh, instead of talking to newsmakers, they might call a reporter who's on the scene. So, you know, and apartheid is coming apart in South Africa and you'll talk to a journalist there and say, what, what's the latest? Big election in the United States, you'll call the, uh, you know, sort of a reporter in Washington and get that kind of a thing. And you very ra rarely talk to actual participants, but you would, um, uh, talk to talking heads and mostly journalists. It's a, it was a cool way of doing stuff. Now we'd consider it far too derivative. We're trying to get away from that. But you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it, uh, it was a fun way to get at news. Great, fascinating. Yeah. So then you eventually moved on to uh, to working on All Things Considered. Is that right? What's yeah. the timeline there? Well, uh, I worked in Iowa for a there. while. It was just a couple of years because I'd moved from Buffalo to, to Iowa and. Uh, uh, would, would, would have been happy to, to move back to the... I, I really felt like I should be in one of the original 13 colonies. I mean, I just felt that, that that was the problem, that not being in the original 13 was agitating to me. So I was working to get back to uh, back east, and I filed a lot for NPR, and, and this was in the late 70s. So Iowa had come to everybody's attention because of a guy named Jimmy Carter who mm -hmm. got his national political career started there. So people were still interested in what Iowa thought, and I could do a lot of reporting for NPR from Iowa, came mm -hmm. to their attention, and then applied for uh, a, an associate producer job and got it. And at one point you were producing six shows a day for All Things Considered. It seems like I read that. With that newscast. Is that, it sounds like an incredible pace. Well, I mean, it's up. one an hour. It's one an hour. They're five minutes each. And again, you, you sort of get the rhythm down pretty well. Um, so it's, no, it's, that was the easiest job I ever had in my life. So you would want to do that again? No, it was the easiest job I ever had in my life. Who <laughs> wants to do that again? <laughs> in 1990, uh, you left All Things Considered to start an alternative school in Washington, D.C., right. which you mentioned earlier. What, what was the alternative school? We had seventh graders from around the District of Columbia who uh, met uh, an economic test. So they were eligible for free and a reduced lunch. Okay, So they were poor kids in the middle of the District of Columbia at the height of, of uh, homicide mania in that city. It was the number leading um, city per capita for homicides, the crack epidemic. And we were getting kids who were nominally two years, be or two years behind their nominal grade level, but showed no learning disabilities. So in other words, they're about to become lost to the mm. system. They're, there's no special help. They're just fallen. So we thought we would create a school that included performing arts and basic skills and see if we couldn't integrate a curriculum that kept kids very active engaged in creative pursuits. What an awesome idea. It was a great idea. Uh, but unfortunately, it was, it was a pork barrel project. The director of the museum where this was founded and started was good friends with a lady called Tipper Gore. You might have heard her. And her husband, had this, he had a government job. And he was a senator, and he, of course, he was the president of the Senate. When, when the Democrats lost control of the Senate, that project, which passed on money to the District of Columbia Public Schools, our project, which was funded that way, so we were a pork barrel project, and we were doing good, but... And, and so now, we how do you feel about that now, you know? Well, I mean, you know, what we tried to do is we thought, well, once the Republicans took office, maybe we could convince them that instead of a school, we were a prison, and we could still get the money. It didn't work. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, from there, you returned to NPR as a freelance news anchor, anchor and guest host of Talk of the Nation. Uh, how was the freelance news anchor job different than when you worked on All Things Considered? 
Uh, it, it wasn't every day, so you kind of wait for the phone call to come. But the, you know, the parameters of the job were the same. Hmm. Fascinating. What was your experience like working in Albania? Oh, I love Albania, but I'm from Buffalo, so I would. <laughs> it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great place. It's this, uh, how to describe Albania? Uh, it's like Italy without money. Um, and the Albanians are the warmest people. It's a, it's, a, it's a wildlife refuge for human compassion. They're the most mm -hmm. warm and kind of loving people, family oriented. And it was great. And so we were doing radio training because the fact is that country had not had uh, free press for you know, decades or really ever. And um, so we were trying to do that kind of training. What drew you to, to Albania? Well, I was freelancing, and so I got these gigs working on international training. Uh, in, I was in Poland, I was in the Czech Republic, um, Kosovo, and then Albania. So these contracts would come up, and uh, they'd give me a call and say, hey, want to go to Albania? Hmm. And who could say no to that? Yeah. Very cool. Well, we're coming down to our, uh, our last 90 seconds here or so. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong back there in the back, Marnie. Uh, You've been involved in teaching audio drama workshops for, for young people, too. Tell yeah. us about that. Same thing. We want to get kids engaged creatively. It's not so much that it's a vocational skill because there's no real future in broadcast radio, not the kind we do. But to, to work together to create a radio drama is a, a real exercise in teamwork, and um, it's, a, it's and a very creative process itself, the writing, the producing, <coughs> directing. So it's a it's pretty, pretty cool educational tool. I can imagine. Now, last question here, is there anything in radio that, that you haven't done that you would like to do? Repair. Repair? Yeah, I haven't done, I've never repaired a radio. Well, and there you go. I'd, I'd, I'd like to know how to do Somehow that. Somehow I find that hard to believe that <laughs> in all of this you haven't had like one of those crystal radio sets, you know. That, that <laughs> well, you didn't have to repair those, you just kept doing the thing. But you would build them, you know, and, <laughs> and you'd get like radio stations in, in Poland or something, you know, <laughs> shortwave radio. Right. Uh, well, for all of us here at the Artist Craft, Michael and Marnie working hard back there in the control room, uh, and all of us here at RTN, uh, I thank you very much for, for joining us in, in the studio. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed awesome. it. And thank you very much for tuning in. Check out Frank Stacio, the, the host of The State of Things on WUNC. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Awesome. Well.